Hi, everyone. Today we're going to look at two topics which are really the same thing and are a little bit difficult to understand completely. Uh, the topics are work and energy. Each of these has a very special meaning in physics and they are related to each other. In fact, they're basically the same thing. Um, if you've ever looked at a quarter, on one side of a quarter is a picture of the queen. Right? And on the other side of the quarter is a picture of a large caribou. Well, depending on which side you look at, it looks like a different thing. But really, it's still a quarter. And so because it has two different sides, it can look two different ways. So work and energy are kind of like a quarter. One side is more like the queen, and the other side is more like the caribou, but still, it's a quarter. So let's talk about what these words might mean. Let's start with the word energy. Energy is difficult to explain because it's not really a thing. It's more or less um, a state that something exists in. It's a state of existence. Now that doesn't help us much either, because what the heck does that mean? Well, um, we in English we say things like, I have a lot of energy, so I, I feel like I could do something, I could go for a jog, or I could you know, uh, clean out my garage or something. And if we're tired, we say, oh, I don't have much energy, I think I'll just lay on the couch and do very little. And that's sort of how we talk about energy in English, but it's not quite like that in physics. Not quite. I'll give you an example of how you can understand energy. Here's a here's a, what we call an analogy, which is like a little comparison to help us understand it. The analogy, analogy that I would give you is a bank account. Think about a bank account. So I'm going to draw a line here. And I'll put a line right here. And this line represents having zero money in the bank. So, if you wanted to get some money in your bank account, you would have to get a job and go to work. And if you went to work, then you could get a paycheck, and then you could deposit the paycheck into your bank account, and then you could have lots of money. So what you did is you went to work so that you could change your bank account and give yourself some money. Now, the other thing, of course, that you could do is, if you wanted to, maybe it's the weekend and you want to go out and have a good time, maybe go to the movies or go out for dinner, and so you spend your money. And it's possible to spend more money than you actually have, so that your money goes, what we say, in the red. In other words, you lose money. If you have down here, this means you owe the bank money. Not that you have money. If you look at your bank account and it says negative $200 in there, you are in trouble. You owe the bank $200. Whereas up here, let's just say you have $200 of your own money. And so what happens here, this is when we spend our money, right? We get rid of it. We spend our money. Spending money is doing the opposite of work. So spending is like negative work, opposite of work. And so, you see that there's a little relationship here. When we do work on something, like a bank account, we can cause the value of the bank account to go up. And if we do the opposite of work, right, or you could say, if we let the money in the bank do some work for us, like buy our ticket for a movie, or buy our dinner, then the bank account goes down. And so what we have is we have this idea that going to work can change our bank account. I want you now to think about energy just like a bank account. Energy is kind of the universal bank account. Energy is the bank account of the universe.
everything in the universe has a sort of an account of how much energy they have or how much energy they owe. And of course, just like you and I, everything in the universe, in order to change their bank account, has to do work. So work in physics is anything that causes a change in your energy. Right? Work is a change in energy. And we could look at the change in two ways. We could say, well, what? We change up or you change down. So uh, when you do work, well, I'm going to put it this way. When work is done to an object or on an object, its energy goes up. Let's put increases. Let's put energy increases. Its energy increases. Just like if you go to work, you get more money in your bank account. It increases. Let's put its energy. Its energy increases. But if that object does work on something else, That's like spending its energy. So if an object does work on something else, its energy goes down. And by its oops, energy goes down. Let's be careful about the English here. What does the its stand for? It stands for, it goes with the first object, right? Not the something else. Uh, maybe we can word that a little better. Because it sounds like the something else energy goes down. And that's not what we mean. We mean the energy on the object. So I'm going to put an extra words in there to make it very clear. If an object does work on something else, then the objects... energy goes down. And in brackets, well, let's finish this, it goes down. In brackets then, if the object's energy goes down, then the something else, whatever it is, energy goes up. So you see how it's kind of like a trade. The something else energy goes up because you've done uh, goes up. All right. So when you do work, it causes changes in energy. Now the other thing that happens is if energy changes, that means that work is done. Obviously, that kind of goes with the opposite statement, but it makes it makes sense. All right. So if work is a change in energy. Uh, then an object that does work is changing the energy on something else. Okay, now let's talk about how we can describe work mathematically. In order to change something's, ooh, we don't want red, we want black. In order to change something's energy, what do you have to do? Well, you have to apply a force. If you want to change the energy of something, you must apply force. We learned all about forces. So you need to apply force. And you have to cause the object to move. If it doesn't move, it hasn't really changed. So you must apply a force and you must move the object. You must move it. Let's just put it. 
you must move it a certain distance. Okay, distance. Or since we like to talk about vectors, displacement. You must displace the object. Another way of saying that you make something move a certain distance is you displace the object. And so the work that you do on the object will depend upon how much force you put in and how much displacement or distance you have moved the object. And in short form, work equals force times distance or displacement. Now this is the simplest way to think about work. And we're going to add a little bit to this formula a little bit later. After we get a good idea of how this works, no pun intended, we will add to this to make it a little clearer. But for now, we can just start with that. So let's think about, um, let's think about some simple kinds of things we might do. Let's say we have a big box on the ground, very big box. And we want to push this box. So we have to apply a force or pull it. Let's pull it. So we'll pull this box this way. And we'll put an applied force here. And our applied force is going to be 80 newtons. Okay. And let's say that by applying 80 newtons of force to this box, we're able to move it from here all the way over here somewhere, that would be a displacement of 10 meters. Let's just say that's what happened. Well, we could say that we did some work, didn't we? We moved the box. That's work. And so the work that we have done would be the force we applied times the distance that we moved it. And so we moved it with a force of 80 newtons and the displacement was 10 meters, and that means we would get 80 times 10, 800. Now, if you multiply a newton times a meter, one of the things you can get is called a joule. So the new unit that we use for work is called the joule, and it's a newton times a meter. Uh, it's a little complicated because there's different ways of multiplying newtons and meters together. And this is one of the ways. It gives us a joule, or just a capital J for short. So that's the unit. How much energy is a joule? Well, we're going to find out uh, how much work is that. Is that a lot of work, or is that a little bit of work? We'll find that out in a second. We're going to do one more example, though. Let's look at what would happen if uh, another, another common thing we do that that requires work is we have to lift things up. So uh, let's say that you have a big box. This time your mother said, clean up your room. And you have this large box. Let's say this large box is, uh, was uh, eight kilograms full of all your old notes from last year. And you were going to take it in the backyard and burn it. But your mother made you keep it because you might need it. And she said, put it up on the shelf in your bedroom. Well. The shelf is up here, two meters high. In order for you to move the box, you are going to have to apply a force. You're going to have to lift the box up with a force. Now, how much force does it take to lift something? Well, the force to lift is equal to the weight of the object. If you can support the object's weight, you can lift it at a nice constant speed. And the weight of an object, weight of an object, is really another word for the force of gravity on an object, which is equal to mg. So the weight of our object is 8 kilograms times 9.8, and that would be 78.4 newtons. Okay, so that means that our applied force to lift the object, the applied force, has to equal 
78.4 newtons. Well, how much work would we do then? Well, the work that we have done is we have applied a force and we've moved something through a distance or a displacement. The force was 78.4 newtons and we lifted it up two meters. And so if we multiply that all together, we would get eight six one hundred and fifty six joules of work done so that gives you an idea of how big a joule is isn't it if you have to lift an eight kilogram box or maybe it's a box of notes and books um, eight kilograms is around 16 uh, about 20 pounds so a 20 pound box of books when you lift that up to a shelf you've done about 157 joules of work when you round it off so one joule is actually a very small bit of work, isn't it? Right? Uh, one joule would be like lifting about, let's see, about 100 grams, about an apple. If you lifted an apple one meter high, that's about one joule. That's not very much. So joules are quite small. Okay. Now, we have to talk a little bit about that formula. That's the basic idea of times displacement. But there's a problem. And the problem is this. Usually when we push things, let's say, let's push something else. You know what we sometimes like to do? We like to put, when you were a kid, you had a nice wagon and you, with little wheels on it maybe, and you put your little brother in the wagon, and then you pushed him. But you couldn't really push him straight. It's not like you got down on your knees and pushed in behind the wagon like this. You probably had to sort of bend over and kind of push sort of half down and half over, sort of this way against the wagon. But that still made the wagon go. Now, here's the problem. We could push this wagon. I'll put a little thing here. And let's say we were going to push this wagon uh, 30 meters down the street. And let's say that the force that we were going to use, the applied force, is uh, 60 newtons. Here's the problem. Not all of our force is pushing sideways. You see how this red line is moving horizontally. The motion of the car is horizontal. But the force is not entirely horizontal. What we have to do is figure out, or at first we have to realize that this is kind of the same as pushing down and pushing over at the same time. When we're talking about work, we can only use the forces that are pushing in the same line as the displacement. So the only arrow that I can use Actually, I'm going to color it blue so it stands out, is this blue one right here. When I multiply force times distance, I need to have only the amount of the force okay, pushing in the same direction as the motion, which we said was over here. I'll draw another arrow there, see? Going that way. Well, how am I going to know how much the blue line is? That becomes a problem, doesn't it? Well, we can figure that out if we go back to our grade 10 math and we think about trigonometry. Let's say that we were pushing here and this angle that we were pushing at was 30 degrees. Let's just say we knew how much the angle was. I'm going to draw that triangle that I've made there a little bit bigger so we can work on it. So we have this is the force arrow on the wagon. And then we had a green arrow pushing down this way. So this is sort of representing how much of the force is down. And the blue arrow is how much of the force is to the right. And that blue arrow is what I needed to know. Now, if we had 60 newtons of force right here, 60, and the angle is 30, I have all kinds of information 
about triangles that I learned in grade 10. I learned that the sign of an angle, let's call it theta, theta is the letter we use for angles. The sign of an angle, any angle you want, uh, but it has to be an angle in a right triangle, is equal to the opposite side divided by the hypotenuse. And we know that the cosine of an angle is equal to the adjacent side divided by the hypotenuse. Remember the hypotenuse is the long side of the triangle. It's across from the right, a right angle, hypotenuse. And this is our angle right over here, 30 degrees. So opposite is across from it. So this is the opposite side. And my blue line happens to be the adjacent side of that triangle. It's next to it. Adjacent means next to. So let's look at, since I want to know about the blue line, let's look at this part. It's the one that has adjacent in it. Well, my hypotenuse is 60. And my angle is 30. So what if I write cos 30 for the angle? See my angle? And I put adjacent side, which is the blue line, divided by 60. Well, in mathematics, I can multiply both sides by 60 and get 60 multiplied by the cosine of 30. And it's actually 30 degrees, so we should put that there. That would leave me with just the adjacent side, see? When you multiply 60 on this side, 60 disappears. Now, cos 30 is a number that my calculator can figure out for me. So if I go into my calculator and I press 30 degrees and I press cos, cos 30 actually works out to about 0 0.87. And then if I multiply that by 60, it gives me 51 9. Actually, 51.96, so it's pretty close to 52. I guess if I round it up a little bit, it's going to be 52. So it tells me that there is 52 is the value of the blue side, 52. Well, there I know, 52. That's what I wanted. I wanted to know how much of that 60 newtons of force, let's go back to our picture here, how much of the 60 newtons of force right here on an angle was in line with my motion of my car, my wagon. And so the answer is there's exactly 52 of those newtons are pushing sideways. Now you might say, well, does that mean there's eight pushing down? No, it doesn't work that way. If you wanted to figure out how much was pushing down, you would have to use this one, do the same thing, and figure out the opposite side. But we don't really care about the opposite side right now because work is all about the arrow that is in line with the motion. It's parallel or in the same line as the motion. So all we have to worry about right now is the blue line. So look what we did. We took the value of the force, the 60 newtons, right here. And we multiplied it by the cosine of the angle in between black arrow, the force, and the blue arrow, which is in line with the moving of the car. So let's just draw another picture without any numbers. What we said was, if you apply force on something, and the something moves this way, then, and you figure out what the angle is between them, then whatever your force will be here, the amount of force, we just draw, oh, and I can draw my colors. The amount of the force going down and the amount of the force going over can be figured out like this. This one would be the force, the 60, right there, times the cosine of the angle in between, in this case, cos theta. So we'll leave it as this. That way, it doesn't matter what number your force is or what number the angle is. 
Now you can also figure out this. It'll, it'll work out if you did the math the same way. This will be equal to f sine theta on this side. But we don't really care about that right now. We'll deal with that later. So that means that you can extend our formula of work equals force times distance by adding in, this would be OK if, if the force was pushing in the same line as the displacement. But what if you're pushing on an angle? Well, if you add the cos theta in there, yeah, cos theta, and you multiply that by displacement, then that counts for forces on angles as well as forces going straight. Because if a force is straight, that means there's no angle. And if the angle is zero, cos of zero turns into one, and it kind of just disappears. It doesn't affect anything. So this equation works for any force that might be nice and flat and level, the same as the displacement, or it works for forces that might be on angles. So now we can use this extra addition to solve more complicated problems where the forces are not straight. The forces are on an angle to the, move, the movement of the object. Now we like to write this a little differently. Um, because it's all multiplying, remember with your multiplying rules, 2 times 4 times 7 is the same as 7 times 4 times 2, or 4 times 2 times 7. In other words, the order doesn't matter. And we're multiplying force, we're multiplying times a cos theta, and we're multiplying times a d. So we can put them in any order. And what we tend to do is this. We put f d, force times distance, and we put the cos theta on the end so it doesn't get confused with the rest. So this is the way we tend to write this equation, but it means the same as this. It's still force times distance. And this little cos theta part takes care of forces that are at an angle. So we'll do an example of how this might work. And then you should be all set. So let's go back to our wagon. Um, there's the wagon. And there's your little brother inside. And uh, he's standing up on the wagon. Because when we were kids, we did crazy things. And you're going to push him and see if he can balance. And you're going to push him this way. And you're going to push him 30 meters down the road. And you're going to push with a force of 60 newtons. So we're back to our original question. In order to calculate the work that you would do, we do work equals force times distance. Oh, and of course, I would have told you that you're pushing at a 30 degree angle. You kind of have to know that. So you write work equals force times distance, but because you have an angle in there, you add cos theta. And now to get the work that's done, what you would do is write in 60 newtons of force from the picture. That's how much force was pushing down on the wagon. And then, of course, you were pushing the wagon 30 meters. So that's our displacement or our distance. So multiply that by 30. And then the cos theta. Well, you look up here at the angle. It was 30 degrees. So you write in cosine of 30 degrees. And then you multiply on your calculator all of these things. So you end up with 60 times 30 times, and then you put 30 and press cosine, and push it all together, and you get a nice big number. 1, 5, 5, 8.8 .8 joules of work. Right. And what the cos 30 did is it allowed us to figure out how much of this angled force was pushing in line with the displacement of the object, which is this way, see, in line. So that's why it's important. And that's how much work you did pushing your little brother 30 meters down the street. Now, this can get more complicated in questions where they don't give you the force quite so easily. They make you use all the information you learned in previous units to maybe figure out how much force there was. And then you can find the work. But for now, we're not going to do that. We're just going to do the work and keep it simple. All right? So this is how you find work. 
And this works for forces on angles as well as for forces that are straight. So you can use it every time. All right, I'll give you a couple of questions to practice on your own and try. So let's say uh, I gave you a picture and I said, okay, uh, here is a box and you are going to pull the box with 80 newtons and you're going to move the box 20 meters. Figure out how much work is done. How much work do you have to do on the box? That's question one. Then question two, I'll do it in a different color so we can keep it. Question two is what happens if you want to, this time I'm going to see if I can trick you. I'm going to pull on a string this way at an angle of 20 degrees with a force of 50 newtons. And I'm going to move this block this way uh, 15 meters. How much work have I done this time? So now pause the video and try and figure out the answers to these two questions. And then when you're ready, restart the video and I'll show you how the solutions should work. All right. Okay, so you paused, you tried it on your own, and now we're going to check our answers. Let's do the red one first. Well, in this case, the force that's being applied is in the same direction as the motion or the movement. So those two things are already lined up. So we don't have to worry too much about an angle. However, there's two ways you could do it. So let's do it as if we said, oh, there's no angle, so I won't worry about the cos theta part. And then we would just write FD is 80 newtons times 20 meters. And that equals uh, 1600 zero, zero joules. And that's all there is to it. That's the correct answer. Force times distance. Now, if you wanted to use the other formula, you could. I'm going to write it in blue so you can you know that you don't need this for this question. If you put cos theta here, you wouldn't be wrong because it would be cosine of zero degrees. There is no angle between the 80 newtons and the 20 meters. And the cosine of 80 newtons, or sorry, the cosine of zero is one, so that would just end up being one multiplied here. And of course, 1,600 times one is still 1,600 joules. So you see how you really don't need the stuff in blue for this question. But it wouldn't be wrong if you did. That's why, that's why I said that this formula with the cosine theta still works for straight forces, lined up forces. But down here we have a little problem. The force is on an angle. Now it doesn't matter if you push or pull. All that matters is the angle that we have. So we write Fd cosine of theta. And we have a force of 50 newtons. We're going to multiply that by a displacement of 15. And this time we do have an angle. So we write the cosine of 15 degrees for my angle. Oh, sorry, no, 20 degrees. I was looking at the wrong number. The cosine of 20 degrees right here, 20 degrees. And then the calculator does the rest for us. And so if you multiply 50 times 15 times the cosine of 20 degrees, you get the answer 704 point about 8-ish. And that would be joules of work. So that's how you do it with an angle. All right. In uh, the next video, we'll see how we can use work and energy together. And how we use, we'll start to talk about how we use little simple machines to make our life easier. And... Uh, Make, make it easier for us to accomplish tasks like pushing things and pulling things and, and whatnot. Okay, great.